Maybe one of the cameras can, can catch both of those sensors at the same time. It's sucking in dust now. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but it's demo camera, so that's fine. It's fine. Cinema 5D Stage at Photo and Adventure is brought to you by Blackmagic Design, creating amazing solutions for film, post-production, and television. Rotolite, advanced LED lighting, and Canon, live for the story. Good morning from Photo and Adventure um, show here in Vienna. Uh, we're here at the Film and Video Stage, which is um, yeah made possible by the sponsors in the back and actually Cinema 5D. We fill it with content and we invited Philip Bloom. Hello. And Hi. Hans from Sonntag. Hi. Um, and this is actually the first time ever, I think, that those two cameras share a stage. So we're talking about first time they touch full frame, there we go. full frame cinematography <laughs> with the Canon C500 Mark II, which was newly announced, and the Sony FX9. So one thing I have to say that Sony made very very clear to me: the final version of the FX9 is going to be gray. This one is black, so don't confuse it with the FS7. The final version is going to be gray. But other than that, it's, it's the same camera. I think it's called Venice Gray. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I'm actually amazed now for the first time that we see them next to each other, how much smaller the C300, uh, C500 Mark II is. Yeah, it's not fair. It's got a massive lens on it, though. Yeah, but still, even, still, if, yeah, if, you, even if you yeah. take the lens off, yeah. But yeah. anyway, let's, let's start with a short uh, introduction of you guys. So, Hans, you actually worked with the C500 Mark II yes. for the launch of the camera with Canon. Uh, yeah, I, I, I got the chance, you know, to have the camera a weekend available, and uh, we did a little short film, which I might show later in the, uh, yeah, I think at uh, one o'clock something, okay. Um, uh, do I sh sh uh, talk a bit about the camera more, or what, what, what do you, yeah, I mean, are like, you asking me? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, the... What cameras do you usually? You're a okay. director, right? Yeah, yeah, direct. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, commercial. Commercials. Yeah. Um, usually, I'm working with the um, with the uh, Arri, Alexas, or I'm working with the um, with the Red cameras, or with the C700 from Canon, which uh, in the last year it was, was I had a few opportunities, and um, now I did a a test film with this camera, and I must say it's a brilliant little camera, right? I mean, it's kind of amazing how much, how many features they put into this, especially if you think about it, like uh, like the 6K and the internal raw recording. Yeah, was uh, something yeah. I didn't expect from yeah. Canon this to put is, into something. This is this is the cool thing about the camera. The cool thing is it it, it delivers 6K, 5.9K to be you know accurate, 5.9K uh, raw, which is a bit like you know the red theme, right? The red thing is actually the same. Right, and then you got then you can record in 4K, or you can re record uh, via via V some kind of codecs. Um, I think 10-bit codecs, of course, and you can add a PL mount, so you can use proper PL lenses on that, which is important for me. And now it's user interchangeable for the first time, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's brilliant. I mean, that is a um, that's a big thing for Canon, actually. I think, yeah, and and. Um, when we're speaking about color, it's Canon, so there are no worries really, and I, um, they do have a interesting possibility. They you you can you can choose two color signs. You you can go for the Canon color signs, or you can go for the um, more called neutral color signs. And what you can also do is that is important for the cinema people or the commercial people is you can use it with the lock encoded. Um, um, uh, lock and code developed uh, raw files, you can, you can use it in ACES. And then you can use different IDTs on that, which gives you real, you know, massive creative uh, possibilities. To, to be within the yeah, ACES yeah. color yeah, yeah, grade. Yeah, 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 which is great. Yeah. So uh, actually, none of us here on stage has used both cameras yet. I think Philip and I, we were invited to the... Uh, Sony showed us this one a little bit early. So what, are, what is your take, you know, like, this camera versus FX9 without having actually worked with both, but it, I know so, it's difficult. So yeah, let me give my. But what my, you, I can I can sum up my experiences with the camera <laughs> uh, of the C500 when I held it for 
Five minutes. For about 30 seconds trying to take a photo of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's really nice. I, the specs are great, and it's the size is important. Um, the, inter you know, the Canon RAW light is nice. It's easy to work with. And a 10-bit internal codec. It's got, I have a C200 amongst many of my cameras. It's one of my main cameras for documentaries because of the autofocus, which is we'll talk about. Um, it's a very useful feature for interviews and other, certain other filming. Uh, I just really I like it. I like the fact it is. I like the modular form factor. I've become very used to it recently, coming from a, 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 a background of shoulder cameras. And but these days we want things to be adaptable to go on to gimbals and things like that, and it's really nice. Uh, so for example, the you know the FX9 is a much much bigger camera to put on a gimbal uh, compared to this. We can strip this down. You know, it is pretty stripped down anyway but we can take off the handle and everything and make it a really nice rig. So I think it's got a huge amount going for it. And the interchangeable lenses is really cool. The only thing we've, uh, you know, we already talked about is such a shame that the design of it, they couldn't get it um, flush enough on the, the interchangeable mount to put in an RF mount. RF is the new the, it's uh, the new lens system, the new lens system standard. for Canon that is on their mirrorless uh, stills cameras. Their lenses are amazing. They're incredibly expensive. But uh, they're amazing, and it's one of the, the it's, Canon aren't known for really innovating these days, but their glass is, is innovative, definitely, their new glass. And it's a shame it can't go on there, because um, it's, EF glass is, it's old, you know, it's, it's an old system, and it's, it, would have, it would have been nice for them to take advantage of all these new lenses they've been bringing out, which are, which are incredible. But other than that, I mean, it's, you know, I'm a big fan of the, the C2, C, C line. I've had the C300, the C100, the 1DC, and the C200. So I've had, them, had a, quite a few, and I think they're great cameras. I think out of the box, uh, I mean, we, I think we all agree that you get more. I mean, you pay more, but you also get more for the money compared to the FX9. And I think this time, in my opinion, it's a very difficult, very difficult decision for a lot of people because it's not clear which one will be the, the winner in a way, you know, like the original C300 was a huge hit and yeah. then the C300 Mark II was a great camera, but it came out a little bit too late maybe when the FS7 was already quite established which was also less expensive and now you have the FX9 um, which is a little bit less mm. expensive than the C500 Mark II but it also has a lot less features you don't have internal RAW Uh, you don't have 6K recording at all, um, and you only have co like 10 bit. So yeah, it's it's a very good codec. Though I think I think what what I can imagine happening is so the C300 was huge for HD, and then the FS7 came out, and that's become a real standard for for, yeah. for TV 4K production. And I can see it an FS7 com production company or owner operator. They will, I could imagine them moving to an FX9 rather than this because it makes total sense because it's a very similar camera. Similar accessories, same lens mount. It makes total sense. Whereas, you know, other people could switch it. When it comes to people who don't have either, they're going to weigh out the pros and cons. Um, I have not used that, so I can't. And I've only used this for a few hours. I get, I'm getting one on Tuesday for 10 days to shoot with. So it'd be a good chance to really get But the, um, the color out of this, I mean, people are always saying Sony color is not great. Uh, well, it's not true. Uh, you can get great colors, but the color out of this is re really nice. And I have a, a new profile called Cinetone? Cinetone. S, S, Cinetone. S Cinetone, which is just beautiful. Straight out of the camera, just beautiful. It's, it's not a log profile, um, but it's, it's beautiful. So I'm really, I just think it's, it's got a lot going for it. Um, I would personally wish it was more of a modular form factor, personally, rather than the larger one. But, um, you know, the fact is we finally have full-frame um, cinema video cameras. Well, I've had, I've had one for almost a year, but that's the, the kid affinity. Um, but, but yeah, with the major focus. manufacturers, yeah. I mean, we've been asking for this for over 10 years now. Over since, 10 since years? Since the Canon 5D Mark, uh, yeah. 5D Mark II came out. Yeah, 10 years. We've And then, <laughs> you know, like it took them a long time to actually put a full-frame photo-sized sensor in professional video cameras. And then it started with the Venice and then with the C700 full-frame. RELF. RELF. Actually, what surprised me about the 
of the C500 Mark II is that you know, this camera is, if you compare it to the other Canon cameras, how much a C700 full frame costs. Yeah. And the normal C700 has a Super 35 sensor. Yeah. And this is a full frame sensor, which is probably the same as yeah, the one with the C700. A, in the end, it is a new generation. Yeah. Just, just think about this like, like that. It's a, it's a new generation. It's a new kind of thinking, which is established with this camera. And well, it is much more, you know, aimed at the people who, you know, who might, who, who normally might might rent, for instance, in, in Airy Mini or, or, or any other kind of camera in this top tier area. And this camera totally um, works in that area, it definitely does. I've been using it with the EPL mount and proper lenses, cinema lenses. In this case, it was the Sumeria Prime, but I used it also with the Ingenieur lenses, and, and it does a marvelous job. And um, the sensor itself is very good. It comes from the um, from or originally from from the say C700 with a improved color science. Is it the same one as the one in the exactly. C700? Exactly, I, I think so. I, I'm not a technical guy actually, but I, I was told it is the you know it's 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 it is the same sensor, and that's fine for me because you know Ari, for instance, is still using the LF3 sensor since since eight years. So um, a good thing is a good thing. Full stop. Right. And um, and it's plenty of uh, sensitivity. Sensitivity. It is um, especially you know, if you nine, if you if you're thinking of you know a 4K production, you are filming in 6K, and then you can you know uh, um, convert it down to 4K, and that is very good for grain or, or, or noise or, or even for sensitivity. So so yeah, this is this is a new a new generation, and. Uh, I wouldn't compare to anything else uh, Canon is build, has been building up to this point. I think both of these cameras use a 17 by 9 sensor, um, right. which is, of course, different from the 3 by 2 sensor, for example, in a Venice. Uh, I think also the C700 full frame has a 17 by 9 DCI sized sensor. Same yeah. one. Same one. So, same, same. Yeah. so if you're shooting anamorphics, of course, I mean, you still have advantages it, it does. It, it does, using it, the large... It, it, it does uh, work because yeah. it, it, usually anamorphic lenses work... Super work, 35. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so, they yeah. are not. They are not. They are exceptions, but they are usually not full frame. And really, it doesn't... Mm. There is no much reason for when, 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 when you're shooting anamorphic for full frame. Maybe one of the cameras can, can catch both of those sensors at the same time. It's sucking in dust now. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but it's demo camera, so that's fine. It's fine. Um, yeah, it's interesting that, I mean, they are really, really similar. Uh, so I think what will be interesting for us as Cinema 5D is putting these two cameras next to each other in our test lab and also, you know, do reviews about both cameras. And the one, there's a very key thing that this has that the C500 doesn't have, and that is um, a variable ND, which is incredibly useful if you've, uh, if you ever use the variable ND on the FS5 and the FS7 Mark II, it's, it's a wheel. And so it's electronic, electronic ND, whereas this is a filter wheel. So you have uh, three stages plus clear, I guess, on that. Up to 10 stops. Yes. Yeah, so, and th but, this one, yeah. you can literally have micro increments. You just dial it in. So you can get your perfect exposure, perfect uh, f-stop, and your correct shutter speed. And that's amazing. Once you've used a variable ND internal, it's like, I want every camera to have it. And the closest we actually have is actually like the EOS R has uh, EF to RF adapter with a variable ND inside mm -hmm. it, which is, you know, again, it's great. It's nice, yeah. it's, it's having that fine, it's all about, you know, having fine control to get it exactly right. And, you know, I've been using video cameras professionally for 30 years and having filter wheels and just being used to the set um, amounts of ND, and this innovation of, of the electronic variable ND is is amazing, and it's it's great to actually have it yeah. in here. But for me, for instance, as a old school cinematographer, yeah. it's much nicer to think in stops and half stops. Yeah, that's what I will, that's what I do, right? I, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm thinking your your brain is double. wired that yeah, way. Yeah, 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 totally, absolutely. But uh, talking about old school and new school, I think what's interesting is the autofocus in both of these cameras, because one of the things that they do really, really, really well, both of them... I think it's really, 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 really well, well, is the autofocus. I mean, this is something that, you know, we didn't even think about years ago, 
But I mean, the first time, I, I mean, Canon has had a great dual pixel autofocus for years that they've enhanced more and more with every generation. Yeah. But and I now Sony has it as well. And it's, it's going to be interesting how they compare next to each other. Because it's really, it's like, I was amazed. I didn't expect anything when I first tried this. And I was like, OK, this is actually usable. Because a lot of the work that I do, like for production work, is documentary work. And this typical thing where you have a, a moderator walking towards the camera, talking to the camera. You don't have a ca like a focus puller with you. Yeah, yeah. This is a typical thing yeah. which is now which easily is, which, doable yeah, with yeah. even a, you know, the f1.4 yeah. can be completely kept which, in focus. Which and that's is really, amazing. really interesting for me because I've never done that. I've never used in my life an autofocus on a camera, right? Yeah. And, and that is going to be the first thing which I'm going to test the next time. What, what, what it does have, and I've tested a bit, but I haven't, haven't shot project yet with that. What it does have, it has a non-linear kind of weighted, logarithmic kind of weighted um, uh, algorithm for the autofocus. So mm. this is kind of mimicking what, yeah. a, what a focus puller would do. It's not like dong, 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 like linear push-pull. It's going like yep. right? You've got this it. is very, very important, I think. Yeah. Even with non-autofocus lenses, the PL lenses, it's, you can set it to tell you when it's, you can, you have a, uh, the thing, you actually tell when it's getting, you, which, which direction you need to turn the lens to get it exactly in focus. It's amazing. Uh, it's just to have that ability, even if you're not using autofocus, to know exactly where it is, instead of having to do the old fashioned punch in and check and things like that, or just hope for the best. Um, you know, I, I know people who've been in the business for a long time and who will just go, eh, no, I shoot manual. I've always shot manual. Yeah, I've always shot manual. And, but I'm all, I've always been open to new technology, which can make my life easier. That's all I want. Is everything, I, if, if something can make my life easier, whether it's increased dynamic range, uh, whether it's increased resolution, whether it's an easier codec to edit with, or whether it is autofocus, which can help me, especially when I, I do, because I'm a documentary filmmaker mostly, and, but I do the interviews mostly myself. So I'm operating and doing interviews. And to, it, it, before autofocus, you're always checking, or most likely you're setting a depth of field where they're not going to move out of it, which means you're not going to get it perhaps as shallow as you'd like. But I shot so many interviews wide open, and it's amazing. And the thing is with autofocus, it needs to do one thing, which is be perfect <laughs> unless it's perfect and you can unless you can trust it then you can't use it that's the thing about autofocus so I you know I have other I have cameras which have very good autofocus but I don't trust it to be always on there and I know that if I'm using my I've got a c200 and that's what I've been using a lot for interviews I know if I'm using that camera it's when I go back it's not going to be focus on the background, which I've had on some, some, ca some cameras that just drifted onto the background. Like, what's, what are you doing? Yeah, the um, cool thing is now you can set them to actually, at least with that one, probably also with a Canon, to keep the focus on the, on the face. And when yeah, the face yeah, yeah. leaves yeah, yes, the yes. shot, it's actually not yeah. you know, focusing on the background. It's just staying where the focus was. You set it to face tracking only. And when it finds a face, it locks onto it and the face disappears. Or, for example, if they just turn their back so they don't see a face anymore, the camera's not going to start freaking out and going, Wait, what do I focus on now? It, it holds until it sees a face again. Uh, and, and the, it's, it, you know, it's, it'll work, it does work really, really well. It, there's times when, uh, very occasionally, it, it's not going to be... It's not, there's, there's, you know, it, there's a time for autofocus and a time for manual focus. Autofocus for me is about tracking and about locking onto a subject. Manual focus is about the ability to choose your focus for shots, for specific shots, if you need to do racks and, and other things, which are much more organic. So you have that, you know, rather than- Creative the, choices, yeah, really. You can still make them very, um, uh, you know, the, the, the way that it does your focus, it's saying it's, it's a curve, it's really nice, but it's still not gonna be the same. Touching, well, this doesn't even have a touch screen, which is, it really needs. It is really nice. But if you've got proper lenses, like PL lenses, anything that's mechanical, manual focus is, 
is easy for most things. It's, it's when you're using stills lenses, that's when manual focus becomes challenging because they're not designed for it. So, I mean, it's, but there's, you know, I've done shots with autofocus, which there's no way, not even the greatest focus puller on earth could have kept in focus. And that blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, I was amazed how it actually locks onto the eyes and, you know, and things like gimbals where, especially when you work in broadcast and you don't have a lot of assistance all the time except for a sound guy. Um, you get a sound guy? Yeah, still. You, you know, fancy like, productions, yeah. <laughs> you I know big, the BBC. Budget productions. The BBC now shoots on mobile phones, like the reporters themselves. Yeah, but they're great. Yeah. <laughs> mobile phones are the future. I've got three cameras on my one phone. <laughs> But uh, on a gimbal, of course, the autofocus, if it works, is amazing, yeah. But the last thing I want to mention before we have to wrap it up, um, the sensor stabilization, so actually the camera stabilization. None of these two cameras has a in-body stabilization, and everybody's asking why. And I actually talked to some engineers, there's a very simple reason. Once you build a ND filter into these cameras, you cannot physically have, they haven't found a way at least yet, to have an in-body stabilized sensor because everybody's giving mm. Sony especially a hard time because they have an in-body stabilization in the Alpha series cameras, of course, but they don't have it in the professional FS, FX cameras now. So the reason is that, and same for Canon, but Canon has a electronic stabilization yeah. built into the C500 Mark II, so it actually works with this 6K that it has. It's a kind of tracking system, really. Yeah. It's a bit like, 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 like if you were in post, post production and you yeah. create a planner tracker, and then you get the tracking data, and from that data, um, you really, it's, you it's know, you, you, you it's the same as what they use in this. The footage. It's and it's getting it's, better. It's and it's better. Yeah, it's so using a gyrosco gyroscopic data, which is what we have, which a lot of cameras actually are recording, including this. Um, and so, although this doesn't have it, there will be software that you can uh, run the, so the, the footage through to stabilize it down to a degree. It's like, so this, out, out of the box, the GoPro 8 is amazingly stabilized, like crazy stabilized, because it's, it's, uh, it's, but it's doing the calculations on the fly. And so I did a big test of stabilizing action cameras, and then I use an old GoPro 6 without stabilization, but has the gyroscope, and then I use software, which, which took that data, and I just chose the amount I wanted to smooth it, chose whether I wanted the horizon to be leveled. And there's, the cost is basically cropping in to your image, so you lose resolution. Yes. But if you start off with a high resolution, like 6K... And with a full-frame sensor It's amazing, as well. yeah. So, I mean, it's... IBIS, the, the sensor stabilization is amazing for um, handheld shooting basically, for trying to keep, you know, not, not like a tripod, but just take away the jitters. It's not for walking, whereas I found gyroscopic electronic stabilization works really well when you're actually moving, better than in, in, in uh, IBIS. So, yeah, so basically, yeah, as you said, the FX9 is recording that gyro data, and you can use their software to stabilize in post. Unfortunately, you cannot do it in camera. No. And with the Canon... The Canon does it in, in camera, so that's the, the difference, but they use the same kind of technology yeah, to stabilize. I, I would say that the, there is an advantage. The, the advantage is there's no, you know, you, you don't have to do it in post, but the advantage in doing it in post is you have control. the ability to control, control how yeah. much it stabilizes it, which sometimes it can be too much. It can, it can look a little bit warpy, and you never want that. You want it to be, and you know, it's sometimes, for me, uh, stable, I, I'm not trying to replicate... When I shoot handheld and I, I have a stabilized sensor, I'm not trying to replicate a gimbal. If I wanted a gimbal, I'd use a gimbal. I'm shooting handheld because I want a handheld look. I want it to look handheld. And I don't want it to be completely obliterated to look like I am shot it on a tripod or a gimbal. I don't want that. So it's, it is, it's, it's, it's a look that I would never... you know. But then again, it, but if you can fine-tune it to the point where, wow, you know... I'll be amazed. La last words from you, Hans, because we have to wrap it up. Do you use uh, stabilization? No, not, not at all. Um, the thing is... Same as the autofocus, right? Yeah. Old school. <laughs> no, not at all. I think handheld is handheld, right? For me, at least. And, um, I, and when I want something stabilized, I use a steady cam, and I'm not using gimbals. And the reason is, steady cams always work, gimbals don't. So, so on a, on a, on a, when, when I'm shooting, I want the thing to work. And I don't want to you know, spend 
time to make things working. So yeah, this is the reason I haven't used it. And then for me, um, you know, a proper Steadicam flies. It's it's a fly. That's that's the reason why people say fly the Steadicam, right? And um, and handheld is handheld. It's like gong 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 like that. It gives you an. It's, it's an it's, it lives it's, it's more. A, yeah, and and there's a huge tradition in filmmaking. You know, when when we're talking about handheld, it does speak differently to a stabilized image. So there might be, for me, at some point, there might be an interesting thing to use stabilized image. But in my book, at least now, is I don't know where to use it in my projects. But but certainly I, I will test it and I will find out. As well as like the autofocus, never tried out, and then I let you know. Okay. I think it's definitely longer longer lenses. Uh, there are handhelds. It's it, it comes into. It's basically it's the same. It's the same as an optical image stabilized lens. Shooting with a 7200 Canon with the IS on, means handheld with a rig is totally possible. With a rig, it's got to be balanced on the shoulder. Without the IS, you know, it can be yeah, challenging. It gets it's, it's jittery as long. Yeah, as it, it as does. It does jitter. That's probably because of the, the the CMOS sensor and the way that it works. It's not as you know. It depends. All the, right, guys. The, yeah. I, I have to unfortunately yeah. wrap it up here. Yeah. Thanks everybody for watching, and stay tuned to photo and adventure live streams by Cinema Five D.